So this year we've been talking about the 12 powers of, used to be the 12 powers of man, it really, I guess, would be the 12 powers of people, if we wanted to be a little more politically correct and inclusive. Um, but the 12 powers are one of those things that, uh, that Charles Fillmore brought forth, and it, it became a central part of his theology. And it's not something that you hear about in every church up and down the block. And it's not something that we always focus on in unity, but there's still quite a lot that we can learn from them. And, and quite frankly, if we really understand all those powers, um, we have a better chance of doing the things that we say that we want to do. You know, in a very real way, as unity began with healing, one of the things that the powers were very much like was a shelf full of chemicals that when you had something wrong with you, you could figure out what you needed and you could pull two or three of them down and say, well, okay, I need to invoke my love power and my wisdom power and my faith power and I'm going to mix all of those together and fix what's wrong with me today. Um, it may seem kind of silly, but I, it really is something that, um, that they used to do in unity is, you know, they, they would talk about what's wrong with you and then say, well, you know, kind of, kind of work with faith for a while. or You need to work on your judgment a little bit and uh, see if we couldn't make people better. And that's really not such a bad idea. But as I was doing my homework to talk about the power of wisdom, I noticed some things um, that kind of disturbed me a little bit. So I will share with you first kind of what Unity's original view on the power of wisdom was, and then sort of what I think maybe our cultural view of wisdom is these days, and then where I think we can actually go with us that's going to do us some good and maybe heal us up in a few ways. You know, back when Charles Fillmore was first writing the book, The Twelve Powers of Man, and coming to his original idea of what the power of wisdom was, it's almost like he couldn't describe wisdom without comparing it to love, right? And the story that he uses, the analogy that he uses, is by going back to the Garden of Eden. And he kind of assigns love's characteristics to Eve and, you know, wisdom. He really talks about God being wisdom in that story. But the whole idea is that Eve's character represents, you know, love and the sense consciousness because love is very much about sensation and enjoyment, right? And so he talks about how the snake represents the sense consciousness kind of distilled and that it sort of seduces love into moving away from what wisdom had said, which was, you don't need to eat from that tree, okay? That knowledge of good and evil thing, you don't need that. That's not good for you. Don't do that, right? But the sense consciousness was like, I don't know, I want to give me some of that. You know, I'm going to try that out. There might be something there I enjoy, right? And he goes on to say that there's no need for good and, you know, evil. And we all know that evil is something that we create, right? It's not like there's not like a separate dark power out there on, you know, down below us or at the far end of the universe. In unity, we, we affirm that God is all there is. Right? One presence, one power, God, omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence. And that evil is something that we create by using what is essentially you know, false ideas. Uh, the old uh, acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. <laughs> There's a couple others why, that I know that I can't share on Sunday morning. <clears throat> but anyway... What Charles said in The Twelve Powers kind of made me think. He said, for example, mathematicians don't need to get things wrong in order to learn how to do math, in order to understand the concepts. But I got back to thinking about that, and I was like, boy, when I was a kid learning math, I, I missed a lot of things, and it was like understanding why I missed them helped me get them right 
from then on. And honestly, I think that life's like that. You know, I, the things that I've done wrong help me understand how to be right at a very real level. To me, wisdom, I don't, I don't even know that we could have wisdom if we didn't stub our toes from time to time. You know, I think about all the relationships that I've been in. And, you know, I, at one level you could say, well, you know, none of them worked out, so, you know, you, you shouldn't have done those, right? But I, I wouldn't give up any of those experiences with any of those, those women for anything. You know, it, it's part of who I am. And as most people in recovery will tell you, whatever their, you know, um, drug or habit of choice was, you know, it took every last one of those things to get them to sobriety. You know, it was, it was all part of the journey. So I, I kind of have to say that if we're looking at the traditional view of what wisdom is and comparing it to, you know, Charles's version of love being, you know, Eve in the garden being seduced, I'm not sure I agree with him. Now, I do get kind of what he's saying, and that is that there are times when our emotions, our passions, our physical nature, our physical desires can run away with us, right? I'm an addict. I get that. You know, it, it, it's, not, um, it's not beyond my comprehension. And yet, there's more to it than that. And I'm thankful that there is. One of the things that disturbs me about where we seem to have gone with wisdom these days is wisdom has kind of gone over to the other side. You know, when Charles was writing about this, he was concerned about love being wrapped around the material, right? You know, whether I, I love someone physically or I love, you know, eating cheesecake or I, you know, I love just the experience of my body and I ignore the experience of my spirit and the knowledge that it brings to me. But wisdom in our culture seems to be going towards the physical, and that, I think, is part of our, you know, we call it the age of enlightenment, and we're almost, thankfully, reaching the age of post-enlightenment, the age of enlightenment being that age when human beings stopped believing in things unless they were scientifically verifiable, Right? If I can't reproduce this thing in the lab, it doesn't exist. It's not real. And conventional wisdom these days is all about what I can see and touch. Right? I am flabbergasted sometimes by the things that I see and hear in the news and not to get too political, which I've been known to do from time to time. The idea that we don't want to provide meals for shut-in senior citizens or for hungry children in our schools because it would cost money. That appalls me. And yet, to some people, that looks like wisdom. It makes perfect sense. We've got the numbers right here. The idea that we would remove health care from people who are currently being kept alive because, well, we move a couple zeros and now we can give the very wealthiest individuals in our nation tax cuts because they obviously need that.
Sometimes I'm just left speechless. I, 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 I. And yet I know that to those people, that seems like the smart thing to do. That's the wise thing to do. That is why wisdom and love are supposed to walk hand in hand. You know, love, which I'm going to talk about a little bit next week, you know, can sometimes get into trouble without wisdom, right? Like those famous words, the five words some of us have heard, but daddy, I love him. <laughs> right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or her, you know, yeah. yeah. Or them. Um, you know? Ah, yeah. But when wisdom goes astray without love, sometimes really, really horrifying things can happen. You know, and not to be too, too dramatic about it, but, you know, when we go back and look at what happened in the Holocaust, you know, that final solution, which is what the people who came up with it called it, um, probably seemed to make perfect sense, was very wise, you know, absolutely. So the power of wisdom is not without its dark side, right? What was it, Spider-Man's uncle told him, with great power comes great responsibility, yeah, Wisdom is also something that we, that we really want to cultivate and that we really want to work with. I want to read you a little bit of what Charles said the metaphysical meaning of wisdom is, and it's essentially his way of defining it. Intuitive knowing, spiritual intuition, the voice of God within as the source of our understanding Mental action based on the Christ truth within. Wisdom includes judgment, discrimination, intuition, and all the departments of mind that come under the head of knowing. This knowing capacity transcends intellectual knowledge. And that is absolutely spot on. You know... <laughs> I forget it was last week or the week before I was talking about evil and I brought out um, a little something from Dungeons and Dragons. What's well, interesting, in D&D, &D, um, wisdom and intelligence are both separate attributes of a character. They're actually, they only track six attributes and, and two of them are intelligence and wisdom. So in order to help people understand the difference, here's the... I, I, 3.5 edition uh, definition of wisdom. Wisdom describes a character's willpower, common sense, perception, and intuition. While intelligence represents one's ability to analyze information, wisdom represents being in tune with and aware of one's surroundings. All the way back in the first edition, the, uh, the author, Gary Gygax, used this analogy to describe the difference. He says, intelligence is being smart enough to know that smoking is bad for you, while wisdom is being able to actually quit, you know, something this author has not been able to do. And kind of a sad side note, Gary's no longer with us. Um, but that kind of sums it up very nicely. You can just be smart as a whip and lack wisdom. Right. One of the interesting side notes about that is that as characters age, just like we age, right, certain abilities would raise or lower. Like, you know, from going from very young to being an adult, your strength would go up a point or two, right? And then it would go down, just like some of us kind of tend to get a little weaker as we get older. Some don't. But wisdom is the one score that keeps rising no matter how old you get. And what I think that represents is in 
a very real way as we get older, we know more not only about everything else that's going on around us, but we know more about ourselves. And that's absolutely key to living a life that has wisdom as a power that we access. We have to become self-aware, and then we have to listen to what's going on around us. One of the things from New D&D that it said, it said that anything that has the ability to perceive has wisdom. Anything that does not have wisdom is inanimate, which I think is an interesting way of looking at the world around us. There is there's wisdom in the trees. There's wisdom in so many things that surround us that we just take for granted because it's all perceiving. It's all in this, this boat of consciousness with us. The trick is being able to take something I perceive from here and something I perceive from here and something I perceive from here and knowing from it. You know, intelligence is very linear. A equals B equals C equals D. Wisdom allows me to say, okay, A, D, J, Q. To the power. Right, to the second power. It's invaluable. And one of the things that we have lost is the power to listen to what real wisdom is. You know, we, th we think some of that conventional wisdom is what wisdom is. When real wisdom is, you know, that still small voice within, that thing that we listen for in meditation, we try to tune ourselves into, how many times have you had that still small voice try to lead you in one direction and you were like, nah, this is the way to do it. And then at some point, whether it was that day or that week, that month, that year, at some point down the road, you're like, ah, I knew it. And that's wisdom. So there are a couple things that we can do, right? One is we can allow ourselves the time it takes and kind of get into that discipline of simply listening. You know, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by saying, how many people meditate every day? And, you know, having you sit there with your hand down. But if you're not at least meditating five minutes a day, start with five, right? Spend five minutes a day being quiet, turning within, listening, all right? That's, that's sort of step one. And the second step in really incorporating real wisdom and not conventional wisdom or the, the wisdom of the masses into what we're doing is that when that little voice pinches you, do what it tells you to do, right? Even if it seems counterintuitive to the conventional wisdom that's going on out there, even if it'll make you unpopular with somebody, you know, even if it'll make you late, whatever it might be, listen to that little voice because at some point down the road, you're going to be like, yeah, you know, glad I did that instead of the other thing. Uh, right? We want less of that. But I think that the last thing that we have to do with the power of wisdom is to make sure that we marry it up with the power of love. Because without love, wisdom can sometimes exercise power in ways that simply don't serve us. They don't serve us. They don't serve humanity. One of our friends, John Scott, posted something yesterday that I want to share with you that I think wraps this up very nicely. He said, wisdom, and this may be him, this may be a quote that he uh, pulled off. He says, wisdom is knowing I am nothing, 
Love is knowing I am everything and somewhere in between my life moves. Yeah. Please join me in prayer. Sweet Spirit, for that power of wisdom, for the power of love, and for all the powers that we have been given to shape our universe, to change our lives, to heal, to love, to create, we are so deeply grateful. We now allow ourselves to go forward accessing our wisdom and tempering it with our love and doing those things that are in alignment with that Christ spirit that we are. For this day, for this time, for this place, for these people, and for your wisdom and love in our lives, we say thank you. Thank you, God. So it is.